last two sermons I've done, we have looked at firstly the prophet Elijah, and then after that we had a, a closer look at the interactions of um, Ahab and Jezebel and the role of the man and the woman in the household. So I want to close up um, this morning with a third sermon, and it's sort of a mini-series, I guess, of three sermons, and we're going to look at um, the events that followed on from the lives of Elijah and Ahab and Jezebel in the life of the next prophet, Elisha, the prophet Elisha. So that's where we'll be spending our time this morning, looking at the life of Elisha and the things that happened uh, in his life. <coughs> So I'll briefly cover and re uh, recap of the things that we looked at in the past two sermons that I've done. Uh, if you remember from the book of 1 Kings, towards the latter end of that book, we have the events of Elijah's life and, and also Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, Elijah, as we know, was an exceptionally highly regarded prophet um, by both God and the people of his day and to follow also. Uh, he was the first person we have recorded to have raised somebody from the dead. He, is, uh, he prayed for that three and a half year drought over the land of Israel because of their great sins and that prayer was granted. Uh, he called fire down from heaven on three separate occasions and of course he was uh, only the second man to ever have uh, not suffered physical death in the sense that he was taken up in a whirlwind up to heaven. And then of course in Jesus' day he appeared at the transfiguration of, of Jesus alongside Moses and um, people even thought, they wondered, perhaps Jesus was somehow Elijah the prophet returned to earth. So Elijah the prophet left a great mark upon the minds of the Jewish people in history. That's what we looked at in the first sermon in this series. The second one we looked at more closely was really more focused on Ahab and, and Jezebel. Recall that Ahab's reign was sort of a reign of, of contradictions. He was very successful economically, uh, militarily, in diplomacy. He had lots of influence with the nations around him. He, it says he built many cities and he built a great ivory palace. And uh, the, na the neighboring nations respected him, as far as we can tell. He had influence over them. He could get them to do things that he wanted. And yet, in, the, in his household, it was Jezebel who actually reigned. Uh, she was the one that controlled a lot of his actions. She was the one who guided Israel down a, pa a path of idolatry. She brought the Baal worship into the land in full force. Uh, human sacrifice, all that kind of stuff, is what really gained strength during the reign of Jezebel. And it was because of Ahab's weak character um, that he allowed this to occur. He was strong in so many cases, but when it came to faith in God and the correct structure of how a, a, a household should be run, this is where Ahab's failings was or were. And recall that Ahab, his, his character was sort of weak or deficient in that regard, that sometimes you read in his interactions with Elijah that he, he seemed repentant, he wanted to repent, he, he listened to Elijah on several occasions, and yet so quickly he fell back into his evil ways. He was a, a weak man in that sense, and in a, his faith was very weak, and he quickly fell back into sin. So... Lots of things started during this period. A cycle of events commenced during the, the, the lives of these people and they weren't closed out until the day of Elisha. So let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 19 to start with. And we'll read the first instance of the prophet of, of Elisha the man being recorded in the Bible. 1 Kings chapter 19. This is obviously still during the days of the prophet Elijah and you recall after he had his big contest on Mount Carmel um, and they defeated he defeated or God defeated the prophet um, the, the Baal uh, with the sacrifice on the on the mountaintop and the prophets of Baal were slain Jezebel's response was to say to he sent a, she sent a messenger to Elijah saying that she's going to uh, have him killed basically for what he's done and he flees off to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb and, and God has a conversation with Elijah on top of that mountain and God is basically saying to Elijah, what are you doing here? You don't belong, you shouldn't be here, you have roles and duties to fulfill in the land of, in the land of Israel. And so at the end of that conversation, God charges Elijah with three tasks and we can read them in verse 15. So Elijah rose on Mount Carmel, uh, Mount, not Mount Carmel, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. 
In verse 15, the, the Lord said to him, Go and return on your way to the wilderness uh, of Damascus. And when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. That's the first charge that he receives. You shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. And verse 16, And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. That's the second one. And thirdly, Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mohalah, you shall appoint, anoint as prophet in your place. It shall come about that the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. So, <coughs> Elisha is called, is, 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 being, is to be sought out here at this point by Elijah to replace him. So verse 19 goes on to say, So he departed from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was ploughing with twelve pairs of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. From this we can perhaps infer that Elisha came from a wealthy family to have that many pairs of oxen uh, to assist in farming activities. He seems to have come from a wealthy family. Um, and so Elijah passed over to him and threw, threw his mantle on him. So that is obviously the way by which they, uh, the prophet would anoint, so to speak. The king would anoint by pouring oil on his head. Elijah is in, in anointing Elisha by throwing his mantle on him. And so, um, verse 20, he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. So obviously this has come as a very last minute thing. Um, Elisha is out plowing the fields and Elijah comes up to him and throws his mantle on him and then it looks like he just walks off and you know, says, you're, you're, you're with me now. Elisha says, hang on, can at least let me say goodbye to my family and, and, and well, he also does this sacrifice to God in, in the process. So Elisha is by no means saying no, or and there's no hesitancy or reluctancy from Elisha, but he just asks if he can say goodbye to his parents and his family. So um, at this point, we have Elisha as a prophet in training, working with and under the prophet Elijah. Um, so that now is the end of that that is in the towards the end of the book of first kings and as we've covered the rest of it already we've seen all the things that happened with elijah and ahab and jezebel all the way right up until the end of the book of first kings and the first chapter or two of second kings so now we turn to second kings to see the next time elisha crops up in the history second kings chapter two We know, of course, that Elijah's time has come. He, is, he knows from God that his time on earth has come to an end. And Elijah tells to, says to Elijah several times, you don't have to come uh, with me to, see, to, to come where I'm going. But Elijah ins insists and he persists in sticking with Elijah right until the very last moment. And so in verse uh, 9 of, of 2 Kings chapter 2, they crossed the Jordan um, to where Elijah is going to be taken up. And it says, When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. That's the Holy Spirit, the miraculous gifts that Elijah had. Elisha is asking for a double portion of this spirit. And Elijah says in verse 10, You've asked for a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. And as they were going uh, along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Recall that saying there, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. We'll see that crop up again later. And he saw Elijah no more. And then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. So he is, he, the old Elisha is finished. He's no longer Elisha in training. Verse 13, he took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the, book, the bank of the Jordan. And now he proves 
to the other prophets who were watching this event take place in verse 14. <clears throat> he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and, and struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elisha crossed over. And now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho um, opposite saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. So this is the commencement now of the uh, ministry of the prophet Elisha. He is no longer subordinate to Elijah, but he takes the place of Elijah when he is taken away. And the other prophets who were present recognize that fact. Now, in the chapters that follow, from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 2, all the way up to about chapter 13, give or take, there are several miracles that are recorded about the life, from the life of Elisha. I don't, we, can, we certainly don't have time to go through all of these. You can read them in your own time. It's just history uh, to a large extent. But let's, I'll quickly summarize, if you read them, the things that Elisha did during his ministry. Um, he provides water for the kings of the armies of, there's, a, there's an alliance of three kings from, from Aram as well as Israel and, and Judah. And they, they, they run out of water, so Elisha is uh, called upon by these kings. And for the sake of only the, the only good king there, Jehoshaphat, Elisha uh, gives them water and prophesies their victory. He, in other occasions during, in other occasions during famines, he, uh, or he supplies unending jars of oil. Uh, he also performs a resurrection from the dead, just as Elijah did. Uh, of course, he heals Naaman from his leprosy. Uh, I'm not going to go into that story. I've done that enough times, but um, that's a great story there when he heals Naaman of his leprosy. And he relieves sieges on cities. On, on a, well, two occasions that I can see, he relieves a siege upon a city. So lots of various types of miracles performed by Elisha. And it can be a bit confusing to... to understand the, t the timeline of when these take place. Just as Elisha operated during the time of, of mostly during Ahab's reign, uh, the King Ahab of Israel, uh, Elisha's uh, ministry for the most part is over the time of Jehoram, who is the, not the direct successor to Ahab, but he is, I think he's, there might be a king between him and, 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 and Ahab, but he's a, he's a successor of Ahab a bit down the line. That's when Elisha is uh, performing all these miracles that we read about in chapters 2 through to 13. Um, it also can be a bit confusing to, to see the timeline here because there was also a King Joram in Judah uh, at, at almost the same time, or part of it was consecutive, and sometimes he's got the same name as the King of Israel, so they have similar names or sometimes the same names depending on how it's translated, so it can be confusing to see uh, the timeline of Elisha's ministry. But he's basically working during the time of this King of Israel, Jehoram. Um, it's interesting to... To, to note when you read these miracles that a lot more a lot more of the time they seem to be centered around um, Elisha's compassion for the people. Elijah uh, was sort of more about calling fire down from heaven, that sort of thing. <laughs> Whereas uh, Elisha, his miracles are always about helping the poor, helping the starving, healing people from leprosy, relieving sieges on cities. Even there was a, a fellow prophet of his who lost his axe head in a river and Elisha went and helped him to retrieve his axe head because it was borrowed and he, he was in trouble. So he's always, he always seems to have a lot more concern for the, the smaller people, the problems of the, um, the small people, uh, which you don't really read so much with Elijah. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but you read more about it with Elisha than we do with Elijah. Um, now, I did want to look at two miracles, however, from Elisha's ministry. The first one is because it causes some controversy and problems when we are challenged by non-believers. And that is in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. I'm sure we know the passage if we've ever had an argument with a, an atheist who has read a bit of the Bible. Um, verse 23 of chapter 2 says, Then he went up, this is Elisha, then Elisha went up from there to Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, some young lads came out of the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. So they're insulting him, calling him a bald head. Uh, and when he looked behind him and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. So 
what does this mean here? Um, that these two female, or sh two she bears, t uh, dis uh, basically killed 42 of these lads. And a lot of the challenge comes from some of the ways that this passage is translated when it says lads. King James renders it as little children. It says little children uh, were insulting Elisha and Elisha brought about their death through the bears. Um, although ne the new King James change it, changes it to youths, which gives it a different meaning from little children. Um, my, my 1995 New American Standard does say l young lads, but then in the 2020 translation it goes to young boys. So it does the opposite of what the King James does. The older one says little children and then they go to youths, but now New American goes from youths to um, young boys. But it doesn't, I don't know why we have this controversy. Anyone who does a basic word study of this Hebrew word will see that there is a wide variety of meaning. The Hebrew word is nar, N-A-A-R, transliterated. And we can see that word crop up many times in the Old Testament. So let's flick over to chapter 4, verse 12, and see how the word is used here. And in chapter 4, verse 12, we're talking about Elisha's servant. And it says, uh, then he said to Gen Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite, and when he called her, she stood before him. So when you see, then he said to Gehazi, his servant, his servant is the same Hebrew word as we saw with the young boys or little children or youths. Nah, it's the, exactly the same word being used. Um, we can turn back to 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 19. Um, 1 Kings 20 verse 19 says, this is back in Elijah's day, um, so these went out from the city, the young men of the rulers of the provinces and the army which followed them. So the young men there is also using the Hebrew word nar. So these young, these are not obviously little boys, they're going out with an army uh, and they're rulers of provinces. We're not talking about little children here, are we? And then finally, you can turn all the way back to Genesis. I mean, you could argue, I suppose, that the meaning of the word has changed over time, but in Genesis chapter 41, talking of um, Josh, uh, Joseph, uh, verse, uh, sorry, Genesis 41, verse 12, it says, Now a, he a Hebrew youth was with us there, a servant of the uh, captain of the bodyguard, talking about Joseph. Now how old was Joseph at this point in time? If we turn to verse 46... It says, now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And you can read the whole context there. But the point is that Joseph was called a nar, a youth, a little child, if you want to translate it that way. But he was 30 years old. So you can see there is a range of meaning. Because certainly sometimes the word does mean little child. You read the context and you determine what it's talking about. So there's certainly no reason why you should translate it in, in this instance with the, with the bears as little children or young boys. There's, you're not forced to that conclusion and I would say given that um, they're, they're saying go up you bald head go up I think they're probably referring to Eli Elijah when he went up they're saying you go up too get away we don't want to hear from you they're telling him to get lost basically um, they're, they're insulting him uh, they're probably not little children they're probably teenagers or, or young men even uh, of the uh, you know ruffians I guess you might call them or um, delinquents that kind of that kind of uh, meaning is what we should take from this passage. So having spent some time on that miracle there that Elisha performed, which is so often, you know, uh, makes people turn away from God, or can at least, um, let's turn to a, 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 a miracle that gives us another picture on the same sort of um, idea, and that's in 2 Kings chapter 6. So turn back to 2 Kings chapter 6. So in this, I'm not going to read it all, but the context of this is that um, a, siege, a city has come under siege by the Arameans. And um, Elijah, Elisha causes the, the besieging army to become blinded. And he basically deceives them and, and leads them away because they're blinded. And so what happens in, uh, in 2 Kings 6 verse 19, um, he says to, Elisha says to them, the besieging army, he says, This is not the way, nor is this the city. They're blind and they don't know. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. That's himself. 
and he brought them to Samaria. Now Samaria was about, um, not that far away, maybe 15 k's away from the city that they were in, which is Dothan. When they had come to Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Then the king of Israel, that's Jehoram still, it's Jehoram we're still looking at. Then the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And Elisha answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you had taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and he went to their master. And the marauding bands of Aramaeans did not come again into the land of Israel. So the reason why I honed in on that miracle because you can compare it against the one with the bears where it makes it look as if Elisha is heartless or doesn't have compassion on people but in this instance you have these basically helpless soldiers who are probably just following the orders of the king of Aram who haven't done anything personally against Elisha or the people of God Elisha's um, attitude is to uh, take mercy on these people and let them go in fact give them food and significantly we read right at the end of verse 23 there it says the marauding bands of Aramaeans did not come again into the land of Israel and there was a long period of peace because the Aramaeans were constantly attacking them they didn't come in for a while and so indeed when Jesus says blessed are the peacemakers we see that in action there don't we that by giving those people um, mercy and, and, and feeding them that that resulted in um, a good thing for the people of Israel. Now, I said I didn't want to spend a lot of time looking at Elisha's miracles, and so we're not going to do that. But I did want to look at the closeout of, as I mentioned earlier, the things that took place during the reign of Elijah, and oh, not the reign, the, prof, the ministry of Elijah and the, the um, reign of King Ahab and, and Jezebel. So, recall... We read at the start in 1 Kings 19 that Elijah was tasked with three things. To anoint Elisha as his prophet, as his successor, which is what we've read about. But also to anoint Hazael as king over Aram and Jehu as king over Israel. And Elijah never fulfilled those two tasks. They were performed by his successor, Elisha. So turn to 2 Kings chapter 8, verse um, we'll start in verse, uh, in verse 7. And this is what happens with the anointing of, of Hazael as king. Now, these are, the, these are Aramaeans. They're not uh, part of the covenant. They are uh, in the northern, northern lands around Damascus. And in verse 7 it says, Then Elisha came to Damascus. Now Ben-Hadad was king of Aram, and he was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God has come here. The king said to Hazael, that's the Hazael we read about when Elijah was on Mount Horeb, Take a gift in your hand and go to meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Will I recover from this sickness? So Hazael went to meet him and took a gift in his hand, even every kind of good thing of Damascus, forty camels loads. And he came and stood before him and said, your son, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to you, saying, Will I recover from this sickness? Then Elisha said to him, Go, say to him, You will surely recover, but the Lord has shown me that he will certainly die. He fixed his gaze steadily on him until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. Now it's not clear there who fixed gaze on who. I would, I would interpret it as meaning that Hazael fixed his gaze on Elisha because of what Elisha had just said. But Elisha has just told him, you go and tell your master, Ben Hadad, that he will survive, but I know he is going to die. Elisha, the man of God, has just told Hazael to tell a lie. And I think Hazael is taken aback by this. He is shocked. And that's, so I think he fixed his gaze steadily on him. Hazael is staring at Elisha as in, did you really just say that? until he was ashamed. And Elisha is the one who should have been ashamed in these circumstances for what he had just said. And so he was ashamed because of, what, of Hazael staring at him. And the man of God wept. Uh, verse 12, Hazael said, Why does my Lord weep? And then he answered, 
because I know the evil that you will do to the sons of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire, and their young men you will kill with the sword, and their little ones you will dash in pieces, and their women with child you will rip up. Then Hazael said, But what is your servant who is but a dog that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord has shown me that you will be king over Aram. So he departed from Elisha, as Hazael departed from Elisha and returned to his master, who said to him, What did Elisha say to you? And he answered, He told me that you would surely recover. So just as Elisha commanded him, so Hazael ended up doing. He said to the king, You will surely recover. He lied, knowing full well that he would not. And in verse, in, in verse 15, on the following day, he took the cover and dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died and Hazael became king in his place. So we have there the fulfillment of the second task that was given to Elijah, that Elisha went and anointed King Jehu as king in the place of Ben-Hadad. And it wasn't directly an anointing, was it? It was just simply a prophecy that took place. There was no pouring of oil or anything like that performed by Elisha. Which is just interesting there. Obviously, Elisha is heartbroken at what he has been called to do here because he knows what, Eli um, what Hazael is going to do. Ben-Hadad had, had certainly been attacking the, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, but Hazael would be even worse. But nonetheless, Elisha was called to do this thing. Um, that's task two of three completed. And then we turn to chapter nine to see the final task completed. Verse 1, 2 Kings 9, verse 1. Now Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Gird up your loins and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you arrive there, search out Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Notice who Jehu is. He's the son of Jehoshaphat, who was king of Judah. So he's not of the line of Ahab. And go in and bid him arise from among his brothers and bring him to an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and do not wait. So that was the instruction given to um, this, this um, son of a prophet. So a servant, Elisha doesn't go there in person, but he instructs somebody else to go. Now, before we go on, I want to briefly go back into the history of this situation here about why someone from the line of Jehoshaphat is being anointed as king over Israel. Let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 21. Keep your finger in, in chapter 9 here. We'll go back, we'll back there in just a moment. But uh, 1 Kings 19, we have to remember the story of Naboth's vineyard and what brought all this about, the, the final straw, I guess, when uh, King Ahab coveted Naboth's vineyard and vineyard wouldn't sell it to him. So Jezebel arranged that plot whereby um, Naboth was murdered. And, and so Ahab managed to come into possession of this vineyard that he coveted. And this was an exceptionally evil thing in the eyes of God, what he had done. And there was a punishment that would be um, uh, prophesied against Ahab in verse... Um, what chapter are we in? Verse, chapter, I'm in the wrong chapter. Chapter 21. Chapter 21, sorry. First Kings 21. Uh, verse 21. Behold, I will bring evil upon you and will utterly sweep you away and will cut off from Ahab every male, both bond and free, in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you provoked me to anger and because you have made Israel sin. Of Jezebel also the Lord has spoken, saying the dogs will eat Jezebel in the district of Jezreel. So there's the prophecy against the house of Ahab and Jezebel because of this thing that they have done. But remember that Ahab did sometimes repent, even for a little while. And so in verse... Um, uh, verse 20, 29... Um, 
I'll start, I'll read verse 27. It came about when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted. And he lay in his sackcloth and went about despondently. So there is some sort of regret there coming from Ahab. And so there is some respite because of this. In verse 29, God says to Elijah, Do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring about the evil in his days, but I will bring about it in his son's days. So that there is the prophecy that started in the days of Elijah and Ahab. And we see it closed out in the time of Elisha. So turning back to 2 Kings chapter 9. We have just seen that Elisha was told this son of a prophet to go and um, anoint King, uh, so Jehu, the captain of the guard, as king over Israel. But we read more about it in the following verses because obviously everything that he said is not recorded. Um, so verse 4, uh, it says, So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, as instructed. And when he came, behold, the captains of the army were sitting, and he said, I have a word for you, O captain. And Jehu said, For which one of us? And he said, For you, O captain. So he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. You shall strike the house of Ahab your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male person, both bond and free in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dog shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. And then he opened the door and fled. So just as um, Elijah had said to Ahab, so it starts to take place now. So this son of a prophet tells Jehu what he shall perform. And this is, of course, fulfilled in the following chapters um, with... I suppose you might call it poetic justice. Of course, God's hand is involved. Um, in uh, verse 21 of the same chapter, chapter 9, verse 21, Jehu comes to slay, um, slay King Jehoram, uh, who is, recall this, so, uh, yeah, to be, to, just remember, Je Jehoram is king over Israel. Jehu is his a captain of his army, of the house of Jehoshaphat, so not of the same house. Uh, so verse 21, <coughs> then Joram said, and remember that's, that's Jehoram, the names can be confusing, this is Jehoram, king, the, the king of Israel here, <coughs> um, get ready, and they made the chariot ready, Joram king of Israel and Ahaziah king of Judah went out, each in his own chariot, and they went out to meet Jehu and found him in the property of Naboth, the, the Jezreelite, so we can see where events are going, can't we, the very vineyard that Ahab had coveted and slain Naboth for, suddenly now we have Jehu, the captain of the, of the army, in that vineyard with the two kings approaching him. And uh, we, can, <coughs> we can skip down to verse 24. And Jehu drew, um, drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between the arms, and the arrow went through his heart and he sank into his chariot. Um, <coughs> And then verse 25 says, Then Jehu said to Bidkar, his officer, Take him up and cast him into the property of the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite. For I remember when you and I were riding after <coughs> Ahab his father, that the Lord laid this oracle against him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, says the Lord, and I will repay you in this property, says the Lord. So that's what happens. He was repaid in that very property that he had coveted. <coughs> What about Jezebel? There was also an oracle against Jezebel. In verse 33 of chapter 9, Jehu again is the, um, the hand of God in all this. He is operating um, with God behind him to punish the wickedness. This is certainly not to say that Jehu is a righteous man by any stretch, but he is being used here by God to fulfill his purpose. In verse 33 it says, Throw her down. This is Jezebel. 
um, he says, uh, throw her down from the window of, of, where, of the building that she's in. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. When he came in, he ate and drank, and he said, See now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. So there is still some degree of respect there, a concern for the bodies of the dead, given that she is royalty. They went to bury her, but they found nothing more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore they returned and told him. He said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the, Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the property of Jezreel the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of the field in the property of Jezreel, so that they cannot say, This is Jezebel. It's very graphic, isn't it? That was the end that Jezebel met because of her wicked deeds, just as prophesied. Now, you can read chapter 10 in your own time, but we see um, Jehoram is, is killed by Jehu, his servant, and anointed an king in his place. The next thing that Jehu does is to completely eradicate the entire house of Ahab. We read that uh, Ahab had 70 children scattered through the northern kingdom, all under tutors and guardians being raised up and taught. And every single one of those tutors and guardians at the command of Jehu slew um, their charge, the person that they were looking after, such that the entire household of Ahab was eradicated. It even says in verse 11 of chapter 10, all his great men and his acquaintances and his priests were slain until he left him without a survivor. So the entire lineage, the entire uh, structure of Ahab's entire dynasty was completely wiped out by his successor, Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat. So... We now, start, we now see the full circle of events that started with Elijah and Ahab. You have this, it's almost like a good versus evil thing. We have Elijah and Ahab, and the, 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 these two, this pair of men, these two men, one good, one evil. Ahab regards Elijah his enemy, but Elijah has never regarded Ahab as an enemy. And now, the things that started in those days, we see them brought to conclusion in the lives of Elisha and Jehu some decades later. Elijah was told on Mount Horeb to do three things, to, to, bring a, to uh, seek out Elisha and to anoint two kings to replace the ones in Israel and Damascus or Syria. But these two charges were filled by the prophet Elisha. And the prophecies against Ahab's household, because of what he did to Naboth, these, were, these were, were fulfilled also during the time of Elisha because of his repentance. It was done by Jehu, who had been appointed by Elisha in the very vineyard of Naboth, where that great um, assassination took place. So Ahab's dynasty is totally destroyed. You now have Jehu, who is a son of a king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, starting a new dynasty in the northern kingdom of Israel. And so we see here that this great providence of God, the way he bring thing, brings things about in ways that could not be expected, that these promises that were made in one person's day are fulfilled later on in unexpected ways in the days of other people. And the thing is that so far all these events are really focused on the events of kings and prophets and captains of armies and it almost overshadows the, re the daily reality of what life would have been like in the northern kingdom for the common people. We mustn't forget the common people. How would they have been living in those days? Everything we've read about is about prophets and kings. Remember that Elijah and Elisha both ministered in exceptionally wicked times in the kingdom of Israel. And they often came into contact with the kings of those days, but they were rarely welcomed. But because of these kings, the Baal worship that was strong in the lands, the peoples, the common peoples, they suffered as a result. Constant sieges, invasions, droughts and famines. Constantly, we read about in the days of Elijah and Elisha. But we shouldn't think that these people were suffering for, through no fault of their own. Yes, we read about the wickedness of the kings of the day. But what does Jesus say about it in Luke 4, 25? Jesus is 
rebuking the people of his day for their lack of faith, their wickedness. And he draws a comparison between the people that we've just been reading about in the days of Elisha and Elisha with these own people in Jesus' day. In verse 25 of Luke 4 it says, But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. So she's a Gentile, not even a Jew, or a Samaritan, or not a Jew. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage when they heard these things, and they got up and drove him out of the city, and they tried to kill him, to kill Jesus. Jesus is drawing an undeniable comparison here between the common people of the day of Elijah and Elisha and the common people of his own day, that they were both lacking in faith to an equal extent. If only two Gentiles could be healed of their diseases during those days, he certainly couldn't perform a miracle in his home city of Nazareth. So the problem is a lack of faith in not just the kings but the common people and they suffered as a result. God provided so many miracles through Elijah and Elisha to try to show them how pointless and evil their idolatry was. But for the most part, it was fairly ineffective. And I think the same is ob obviously it's true today. You know, we live in a world that's full of idolatry and full of evil. We have kings and leaders of our lands who serve evil ends, just like Ahab and Jezebel did. You have millions of babies, unborn babies, being murdered violently, constantly. It happens all the time. We shouldn't think that we're any better off than those wicked people in those days who suffered from famines and sieges constantly. Homosexuality is being celebrated and you have a profusion of false teachers of the gospel everywhere you look. Our day is just as bad as the day of Elijah and Elisha and the day of Jesus when he condemned those people for their lack of faith. So what's the message for us when all is said and done? It's always the same thing, isn't it? We look to the examples that we can read about. We look to the good examples of Elijah and Elisha and, of course, Jesus. They lived in evil times just as we do, and we read their examples to keep our faith strong so that we don't fall away. Thank you.